Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're going to continue with our series of instructive chess videos, videos to help you play better. We've looked at all kinds of videos, amateur games, grandmaster games, opening tabiyas, end game patterns, thought process, me playing against the computer, uh, fun puzzles, board vision puzzles. I thought today we would tackle the idea of mate and end puzzles, where n is a specific number of moves. For instance, today we're going to look at mate in three puzzles, which means you have to mate in three moves or less. Now, obviously, it's not going to take less in the main line, but there may be lines where the opponent puts up less than best resistance, where you can mate him in less than three. But if he puts up best resistance, you'll mate him in three moves. I've had some of my students and other people criticize mate and end problems as being impractical. They say, well, who cares? If I have a winning position and it's mate in three, if I can easily mate in four, why do I need to mate in three? Or they criticize the puzzles we looked at a few weeks ago in our board vision puzzles as, well, yes, the requirements of this puzzle is not the same as the requirements of a game, so why should I do it? And in that video, I compare that to a football player saying, why should I lift weights uh, in between uh, football games? Because there's never going to be any barbells in, on the field. So how's that going to help me? So what I feel like is any puzzle that helps you learn how the pieces move better, how to create mates better, that challenges your brain to do chess logic better, is going to make you a better player in the long run. Some puzzles obviously more than others, but to restrict yourself to only things that can occur in games is not necessarily the most optimum way to get better. I think most really good players enjoy doing puzzles that have some sort of special requirements and um, restrictions to them. Okay, so let's, let's view this puzzle as if it was just white to play and win. This is a puzzle by a guy named Muller, and the book that I'm taking all the puzzles out of today is a very nice book that I bought many years ago called The Bright Side of Chess by Irving Chernev. And I'm looking in his section called Problem Special Favorites. So these are probably problems that he thought were special favorite problems that he liked. And uh, this problem, as I said, is by Muller, Mate in 3. Suppose it wasn't Mate in 3 and you just wanted to win the game. You could look at the board and say, well, Black's kind of running out of moves and his king doesn't have very many moves to, to go. He can only either play king to a2 or bishop to g8 or g5. So why don't I just play rook to g8, he'll play bishop to, sorry, rook to b8, he'll play bishop g8, I'll get a queen, he has to put the bishop in the way, and now he has moves with the g-pawn, he's not in tsukfang, so I'll just play something like queen to b7, threatening queen b2 mate, he can throw the bishop in the way, I'll take it off, it's still not checkmate, he'll push the pawn, and now I can mate him with queen to b2, or queen to a3, or queen to a4, or rook to a8. Well, but that takes five moves. And this puzzle is white to play and mate in three moves. So clearly white's winning. He would have no trouble winning the game, but he has to mate in three. So let's try that move, rook to b8. If we play rook to b8, then clearly king a2 doesn't work because we can go up and make a rook or a queen, and it's checkmate. So his only defense would be to play bishop to g8. And now white has to mate in two more moves. If he takes time to take the bishop on g8, then black will play king to a2. And now if we get a queen, king to b3, and it's not checkmate. If we play rook to b8, and he plays bishop g8, and we get a queen right away, then bishop to b uh, bishop to a2 as we said before and white has no mate right away so how can white improve on this idea well he could try something like rook to h8 because now if white plays king to a2 then white can switch ideas put his rook back on b8 to stop king to b3 and no matter whether black plays king a1 or king a3 or g5 or bishop to g8, white can play a8, get his queen or his rook again, and checkmate. So we can see that on rook to h8, that king to a2 doesn't help. But what about bishop 
to g8 again. If white now plays a8 queen, then bishop to a2, and there's no checkmate. If white stops to play rook takes g8, now the rook has moved twice, and he's threatening to play a8 queen mate, but black doesn't have to move the g-pawn. He can simply play king to a2, and white doesn't have time to play rook to b8 and a8 mate. It would take him four moves to mate instead of three. So how can, how can white improve on this? Taking the pawn on c2 to, to be across from the king on a2 clearly doesn't work. Black will just play check, forcing white to make a second move with the king, and now he's not even going to have a check on the third move. So taking the pawn on c2 doesn't work. Well, what I think is the red idea is to combine the ideas we looked at before and to play the move rook to g8, which of course looks like a silly move because we're putting our rook on prees. But let's see what black can do. If black plays king to a2, we're going to go back to play rook to b8, and on the next move we get a8 rook or queen mate again. So the main line is going to be rook to g8, bishop takes g8, pawn up queen, and now when the bishop goes to a2, the big difference is there's no rook on the 8th rank anymore blocking the queen. The rook on the 8th rank was actually a hindrance in this position. We wanted him to take it. And we get queen to h8 checkmate. So that's got to be the right answer. White plays rook to g8. If black pushes the pawn, then white will simply play a8 and get a rook or a queen mate. So after rook g8, we saw that king a2, white switches plans with rook b8. And finally, on bishop takes the main line, pawn up queen, only legal move is bishop a2, and the pretty checkmate from h8. So that's a problem by Muller. Let's go to another problem from uh, Chernev's book, uh, The Bright Side of Chess. And all these problems are going to be mate in three. All right, let's bring this one up. Okay, again, white to play and mate in three. Well, we notice right away that black's bishop is on prees, and the bishop is the only black piece that can move. Let's say white takes it off just for the sake of argument. Black's only legal move is king to b1, but now black's threatening to get a queen with check. And what can white do about that? Uh, white has to mate in two more moves, and he's going to be in check. If he plays something like bishop a3, a1 queen check, let's say bishop here, that's three moves already, and white's not in mate. So it's pretty clear the answer to the problem isn't to take the bishop. But one thing we notice is if we can get the rook to the first rank, that's going to be a pretty quick mate. And right now the knight's in the way. So there's two things we can do. We can move the rook to g8, or we can move the knight out of the way. The problem with moving the knight out of the way is that one of the ways to stop rook to h1 is to just take the rook. And that's not going to mate on the first rank. Black can play rook to g8. And now he's threatening mate on g1. So what can black, white do? White can play bishop to d4, blocking that square. Now, white has a continuation that'll mate. He could play rook g1 check anyway. Bishop takes g1, bishop g2, g7 check, bishop d4, bishop takes d4 mate. The problem is that's four moves. One, one, two, two, three, three, four. So it's not mate in three. So rook to g8 will mate in four if he checks. Can he, can he improve on that check somehow? Can he, can he somehow get the bishop to go away? Let's say he tries knight to f5. Well, the problem is that black can put his bishop almost anywhere. Let's say he puts, puts it back on f3. Well, white's already made two moves. If he plays rook g1 check, it's certainly going to be mate again, bishop e1, and now white has two mates, bishop g7 mate and rook takes e1 mate, but, but both of those are on the fourth move. 
So rook to g8, bishop d4, knight f5 doesn't work. Uh, random moves don't work. He's not in zugzwang after bishop here. Uh, black could even play bishop g7 here. The bishop can't go to f6 mate. Rook takes g7 as stalemate. So that doesn't work. At this point, we have to look for kind of other more interesting ideas. The brute force get the rook to the first rank doesn't seem to work, and we wouldn't expect it would in a, in a nice puzzle. You know, nice puzzles have nice solutions. So the brute force method of getting the rook down to the first rank, we would expect black to have defenses against that. Well, now we notice something really interesting. The black king has no moves, and if a knight could check him, it would be made. But the only two squares where a knight can check him are c2 and b3. The king's on c2, so if the king moved off of c2, the knight would have to get there in two moves, which it can't. But can it get to b3 in three moves? One, two, three. Aha! That means the knight would have to make that move on every move. He'd have to make f5 on the first move, d4 on the second, and b3 on the third. Is there any way we can force black to allow that? Well, one of the problems that we notice right away is the second move in that sequence, knight to d4, is on the long diagonal. So white would have to get black's knight, uh, black's bishop, off the long diagonal while he's making those three moves. But, but if he's making those three moves, he doesn't have time to get the bishop off the diagonal. For instance... Knight f5, bishop h8, knight d4, bishop takes d4, and there's no mate for white. So it doesn't seem possible that the knight could both get to b3 in three moves, and you can remove the bishop from the long diagonal. You know, even though when you play knight f5, you're threatening rook h1 mate, it doesn't distract the bishop. The bishop wants to take the rook, but it doesn't distract him off the diagonal so that knight d4 still doesn't work. So now we see the idea of mating with b3, at least by brute force, by playing knight f5, knight d4, knight b3 doesn't work, and the brute force method of forcing the rook to the first rank by moving the knight out of the way, and then the one of playing rook to g8 doesn't seem to work either. Is there some sort of way we can distract the bishop so that he can't do that? For instance, maybe play a move like bishop to b4. Okay, the problem is the knight and the rook haven't moved yet, so there's not too many threats. Suppose black simply, well, he could take off the rook or he could take off the bishop. I think both of those are probably going to work. If he takes off the rook, the bishop needs to get to the long diagonal to mate because the knight can lo no longer has time to get to b3, but there's no way to get the bishop off the diagonal. If the knight attacks it, the bishop stays on the diagonal, and there's no mate. So it doesn't look like somehow we can distract the bishop. Is it possible he's in some, some sort of zugzwang if we just guard all the squares? Maybe we could play a move like bishop here. And the answer is no, he's not really in zugzwang. He can take the rook. And again, we can't get the bishop to the diagonal. We can't get the knight to b3. So what we can do then is be a little bit more clever. What we can do is try to run him out of moves in a much more clever way. Suppose white plays knight to f5. He's now threatening rook h1 mate. If black doesn't take the rook, we got him. If he plays bishop e1 so that rook h1 is stalemate, we'll play bishop g7, king, bishop in the way, and, and takes. Or if he plays knight f5 and he plays bishop e1, we can go for our knight mate on b3 with knight d4. So we have multiple ways of mating him if he moves the bishop off the diagonal. So he's pretty much has to take the rook. And we already saw this doesn't work, that it doesn't get the knight over here, and it doesn't get the bishop to the diagonal. But what it does is takes away all the moves from this bishop except on the diagonal. He has no second direction to move. And what we do is we stick the knight on g7. Now that the knight is on g7, black is in Suxvang. The king can't move, the pawn can't move, but the bishop can move, and he doesn't want to take the knight, but he has to. Bishop takes, bishop takes g7. So that's got to be the answer to this problem by Chiron, the famous problemist. Knight f5, 
We just saw that any move except bishop takes h8 will work for white. For instance, if he plays bishop to d4, we can't take because it's stalemate. Uh, so we just play rook h1 check, bishop g1, rook takes g1 mate. Or we could play bishop here mate because they have bishops pinned. So we can't do stuff like that. After knight f5, his only real defense is to take the rook. And now we say... Go ahead, black, help me out. Let me get my bishop to the long diagonal unopposed. And there it is, unopposed, checkmate. Okay, so that's the second problem in our group today. Let's go to our third and final problem, a problem by Holst, number 55 in my library. Getting things out of my ICC library, Internet Chess Club, chessclub.com. Okay, mate in three. Well, one way to solve this problem is to start with the brute force method and work your way backward. So black only has one legal move right now, and his king is in big trouble. So let's say we just get a queen, and we say, okay, you make your move, and I'm going to come over here to g8 and threaten to come down to g2 and mate you. Well, that would work really, really well if black wasn't in stalemate. But he is in stalemate, and that presents the major problem of this problem, which is black's going to get stalemated very easily. And in fact, we notice that the first move that black always has is to play f2. So we could restate the problem in a completely different way. Instead of saying white to play and mate in three, we could say white to play and help black make a second move. All right, so let's make an assumption. Let's assume that this pawn on f2 is going to make the second move. Then I'm going to make a claim, which is if that pawn is going to make two moves and promote, I'm going to claim that no matter where the king goes to let it promote, I can always check the king. So for instance, if the king goes to e1 and I check him and he goes to, e, to d2, I can get a knight and check him again. But if he's in check, he has to get out of check, and the only way to get out of check and mate black would be to take off this knight with a queen. But how do you get a queen and get the queen onto f1 and still move the king out of the way to let the pawn promote? Well, obviously you can't. So for instance, let's say you get a queen, and black plays here, and now you move out of the way. Well, white would, would love to have his queen on like f8 here, so when you promote, he could take it off with mate. The problem is that, that white had to spend one move moving the king out of the way to give the pawn another move. And when the pawn moves now and gets a queen with check, no matter what white does to get out of check, whether it's to take the queen or move to a safe square, it's certainly not checkmate in three It's that because it's white's third move here. What I'm trying to prove is that this pawn here cannot possibly make the second move. Because if this pawn on f3 goes to f1 in two moves and he checks the white king, when the white king gets out of check, he doesn't have time to like get a queen and then capture on f1 also. Which means after f2, if white makes any kind of random move, again, getting a queen and he goes here, in order to lift the stalemate here, white has to give black a move. And if he gives it to this pawn, it's going to be with check and he can't capture it. So I think we've proven that the pawn on f3 cannot be the piece for black that's going to make the second move because it's mate in three, which means white's going to move, then black's going to move, then white's going to move, then black's going to move, and then white's going to checkmate, which means black has to have a second move somewhere or else it's stalemate. Well, but if it's not the pawn on f3, which can go to f2, but it can't go to f1, who else is going to make the second move? Well, if the white king moves out of the way to give the pawn a second move, then that pawn can move, and we've just proven that that's impossible. So the white king's going to have to stay on f1. But if the white king stays on f1, the only two moves the black king can do are to g1 and g2. But he can't go to g1 or g2 as long as the white king stays on f1. So therefore, if white keeps the king on f1 so that the pawn on f3 doesn't queen, he's also stopping the black king from moving out. But if the black king on h1 can't move, then the pawn on h2 cannot go to h1. So 
The pawn on f3 can't make the second move. We've, we've taken some time to prove that. The king on h1, therefore, can't make the second move, and the pawn on h2 can't make the second move. That means if there's going to be any solution to the problem, it has to be that the pawn on c7 has to make the second move. Okay, but how is that possible? Suppose white plays queen and black plays here. White has to put a piece on b6 or d6 because he can't move this pawn out of the way. And bishops on light squares can never go to dark squares, so he can't get the bishop there. That means that if we're going to give black a move on the second move that's not with this pawn on f3, it's got to be by putting a piece on b6 or d6. So this problem now becomes white to play and on the second move put a piece on d6 or b6. Well, if white gets a queen, it can't go to b6 or d6. If white gets a rook, he can't go to b6 or d6. If white gets a bishop, he can't go to b6 or d6. But the only piece that he can go to b6 would be to get a knight. So that's the move we're going to have to try. Pawn up, knight, f2, knight to b6. Now he has a second move, and now if white doesn't have a checkmate on the next move, there's no solution to the problem because we've already proven that everything else fails. But gee, surprise, surprise, after c7 discovered check checkmate, white does have a move that checkmates black, and therefore this must be the solution to the problem. So the logic in this problem is actually pretty easy, and that is who makes the second move for black? If black's second move is with the f-pawn, then he can check them, and there's no way that white can mate him. If black's second move is, is not with the f-pawn, then the white king must still be on f1, which means the black king on h1 didn't move, which means the black pawn on h2 can't move, which means the only piece that can make that second move is the pawn on c7. The pawn on c7 can't go straight ahead. It has to make a capture. The only way it can make a capture is if white puts a piece on b6 or d6. White can do that, and therefore that's got to be the solution to the problem. So we can actually solve this problem completely by deductive logic. We start with the question, who's going to make black second move? We prove that if we let that pawn on f3 make the second move by promoting, that we have no way of mating him in three, and therefore it's got to be another piece that moves on the second move. And by the logic we just showed, it's got to be the pawn on c7. And again, we deduce that the only piece that can allow that is promoting to a knight. This brings up an interesting point. When you have these fun puzzles, puzzles that were made up by you know, humans to challenge you and make you think, a lot of times they involve one of three issues. They could involve en passant, they could involve castling, or they can involve under promotion to a knight, a bishop, or a rook. So whenever I see problems like this, I always keep in mind, is there an en passant possible? Is there some sort of crazy castling involved? Is there an under promotion in, to, to be in play? Because these are the kind of non-standard moves of chess. The standard moves of chess are moving pieces like they normally move, or maybe promoting a pawn to a queen. You know, castling's a once-in-a-game move, and sometimes castling can do things that other moves can't. Um, en passant is a very special move that opens up two lines where other moves can only open up one line. So it's very popular uh, with problem makers. For instance, if you saw the video I made a few weeks ago, I made one about these board vision problems, and one of them was a retractor. And when I first did that retractor, they actually had the wrong position in the book. And I came up with an answer, but I said, wow, this is a really clever answer, but it doesn't work. And then I proved that no answer worked. And then I said, okay, well, they must have had the problem set up wrong. The king has to be in this other square instead. And now my clever solution works. And when I looked up the problem at the end of the book, they gave my clever solution, which, of course, didn't work in the position that they accidentally had in the book, which was a typo. And I fixed my book and put the, made the position correct so that their answer at the back of the book and the one that I had come up with would work. And again, it involves these ideas of castling in unusual positions, en passant, or under promotion. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed today's Three Mate and Three Problems. Again, to give credit where they, they came from, the book is called The Bright Side of Chess by Irving Chernev. The chapter is called Problem Special Favorites. The first 
uh, author of the, the first composer of the first problem was Muller. The second problem was composed by Chiron. And this problem was composed by Holst. Okay, I already uploaded this video once and it didn't work. And so I've made it a second time. <laughs> Wish me luck in hoping this second time's a charm and I'll be able to upload the, the video and get it to you. Okay, for my YouTube series, this is Dan Heisman. See you next time. Bye.